be heard, but it's so thin, you know. <laughs> we are so delighted to be in church this evening, and it's always a pleasure to look forward to this forum where we have the privilege to worship together as uh, Africans, uh, brothers and sisters uh, from our TD divisions. And luckily enough, we are always blessed to have our, our Filipinos brothers with us and even our Indians brothers because if you come to Africa, uh, most of the people you find us with are Indians and Filipino people. And it's always a delight to have them. And tonight, we are also privileged to have one of our friends in the uh, seminary who will preach to us this evening. Uh, he's with his wife, Evelyn uh, Picio and uh, Picio Augustine. She's seated at the back there. Welcome so much in our midst this evening. This time, we will invite our pastor, Pastor Alfredo Augustine. He is uh, a professor in New Testament study in the seminary. He'll be speaking to us tonight. May God bless each and every one of us and give us listening ears and a heart to accept the message and go home with the peace of God tonight. May God bless us as we listen to our own friend and brother, Pastor. Good evening. Sabaton Jima. Oh, okay. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Feliz Sabado, amigo. Okay. At least I know. <laughs> okay, praise God for this uh, opportunity um, to be invited. As uh, one of your, of your speakers, it is indeed an honor. At the same time, uh, I, feel, I felt uh, humbled to be invited, uh, invited as uh, your speaker because I know the African uh, community are, uh, or uh, the Africans are, uh, uh, are preachers, community of preachers. Imagine I will be preaching to the preachers. So this is uh, a very challenging task. But uh, I uh, accepted the uh, invitation uh, because uh, of your trust. And uh, I was uh, reflecting on the message that I'll uh, deliver tonight. I was thinking of uh, delivering a message from the introduction of the Bible, the Old Testament. However, I decided to go to the body, the New Testament. Uh, my friend, Dr. Mora is not here. No. If, if he will be here, if he is here, he will say, oh, no, that is, uh, the New Testament is the appendix. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm happy that he is not here. Huh? And, uh, tonight, our study, I entitled our study, Principles of uh, uh, Discipleship, Christian Discipleship. I would like to begin with, uh, with a short um, story of uh, uh, Stanley E. Stanley Jones, a Christian missionary to India. Uh, once uh, upon a time, he had the privilege to talk to one of the prominent leaders of, uh, of India. Seeing the, the, fam the famous leader of the Indian independence, Mahatma Gandhi, live, this Christian missionary asked him 
Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ, and often, often, why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming his follower, becoming a Christian? And the uh, latter's reply was clear. Oh, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It is just that so many of, your, of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. Tonight, let us consider some principles of how the followers of Jesus Christ should live so that we will uh, have an effective uh, witness to the world. Let us look at uh, Luke 14 for our study. And I would like to, to ask you to, like what Jesus did to his disciples, uh, said to his disciples, when after praying in Gethsemane, he went back to them and he found them sleeping and uh, told them, could you not watch with me one hour? I hope you can watch with me for one hour. So let us, uh, but I think this will not uh, go to one hour. Let us consider some principles of how the followers of Jesus Christ should live. Let us look at Luke, uh, look at, uh, Luke 14 and learn the principles of uh, Christian discipleship. Let us uh, begin with uh, the first pericope of chapter 14. And one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Uh, there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy, and Jesus asked the Pharisees, an expert in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And but they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, if one of you has a son, in other versions, has a donkey, uh, there is a variant reading here, or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. I would like to invite you first for a prayer. Our dear God, loving Heavenly Father, bless your word and bless us. May we learn your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first principle here that I got from this uh, pericope that Jesus, uh, that, that Luke uh, narrated on the experience of Jesus, of his uh, Sabbath healing episode, is the principle of practicality. Practicality means, the first meaning is that somewhat, some something that uh, makes good sense. Makes good sense. A person's practicality can also be called common sense. Jesus pointed out the impracticality or the uh, of the no or, or the, the no common sense of the scribes and Pharisees when he said if one of you of, of you has a son or a donkey or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day will you will will you not immediately pull him out the answer of course is yes it goes without saying that if 
you, you, will, you will save or rescue an animal on the Sabbath, how much more a human being? Thus, the Pharisees could not answer because Jesus was able to point out their impracticality. The second meaning is the aspects of a situation that involves the actual doing or experience of something rather than theories or ideas. I like the title, The Sabbath in the African Experience. The Sabbath is an experience. Should not only a belief, but an experience. So the, the Pharisees were more concerned with orthodoxy, with right belief, right doctrine, or right theology about the Sabbath. And Jesus was also, was also concerned, of course, of the orthodoxy by asking them a question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? However, Jesus goes beyond orthodoxy. He balanced orthodoxy with orthopraxy, right action or practice. There is a saying that says, people do not care about, you know, people oftentimes do not care about how many doctorate degrees you have. Demon or sometimes they call it doctor of minimum. <laughs> of course, doctor of ministry. PhD, sometimes they call it permanent head damage. Doctor of philosophy. Or THD, I don't know how the other way of saying it. And DD, you name it. People don't care about what you know. Until they know how much you care. <coughs> Open times people get converted to Jesus. Not because of our right theology. Although this is important. Because how do we live. Is influenced or affected by, 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 how, by, by, by what we believe. But in the end. What we believe is only a means to an end. The end is what we have done. Oftentimes people get converted to Jesus. Not because of right theology. Although this is important. But because of orthopraxy. Love in action. I remember, I remember of a story. About uh, Henry Stanley, Henry M. Stanley, I don't know, probably some of you know, know this in, in African history. A famous journalist and explorer of African continent. He, he was tasked to, to find David Livingstone, who was also a, mission, a Scottish missionary to Africa. And, and uh, he, was, uh, he was seeking and looking for him until he found him. And he lived with him for some time. Here in his testimony, he said, I went to Africa as a prejudice, as prejudice as the biggest atheist in London. But there came for me a long time of reflection. I saw a solitary old man there and asked myself, how on earth does he stop here? Is he cracked? Or what? What is it that inspires him? Four months after we met, I found myself wondering at the old man carrying out all that was said in the Bible, leave all things and, uh, and follow me. But little by little, my sympathy for others became contagious. My sympathy was aroused. And seeing his piety, his gentleness, his zeal, his earnestness and how he went about his business. I was converted by him. Although he had not tried to do it. Wow. Yes, brethren. God is concerned with our orthodoxy, of course, definitely. 
but much more of our orthopraxy. Because our orthodoxy is only a means to an end. And the end is orthopraxy. In fact, when God, when Jesus judges humanity in the eschaton, his deepest concern is that what you have done to your fellow men who are in need. In Matthew 25, yes, the, 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 this is the most important, I believe, in Christian discipleship. The practicality of our religion. Second, the second pair copy is found in, uh, in Luke chapter 14, verses uh, uh, 7 to 11. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your, your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. The second principle there that I got is about position. In this pericope, Jesus noticed the natural inclination of human heart. That is, a desire to, to position oneself in an honored place, in the conference, in the division, or in the general conference. Right? This is the desire of the human heart. To be in a position or a place. And even in this simple dinner, people wanted to be in the place of honor. And this is also plaguing our church today. Especially when church election is near. Now, church election is near. All of us are candidates. <laughs> I remember during one of the elections in a local conference level, there, are, there were eight pastors. Eight pastors who wanted to be the president of this conference. And then the constituency meeting uh, came, and these eight pastors were, some of them obviously campaigning to the possible members of the nominating committee, and were expecting, of course, to be elected. But you know what? Of course, you don't know. The one elected was not one of, the eight, of those eight pastors. The one elected was not expecting to be elected. In fact, during that election day, he was just, you know, happily made his, he was just, uh, you know, exercising. He was jogging. And then, to his surprise, he was elected. And majority of the eight, office, uh, eight pastors were officers and directors. But this one who was elected was a church pastor. Imagine that. You know what? Sometimes this church election is counterproductive to the mission of the church because of our human nature. And this is a challenge for us. It results to sometimes factionalism among workers. This is uh, based on my experience so, in the field. And uh, sometimes it hinders the mission of the church. In fact, you know, sometimes it causes the death of, uh, of, uh, of our loved ones. There was a wife, 
after hearing that his husband, pastor, was not re-elected, had a heart attack. And she died. Imagine that. You know, uh, how this, uh, this uh, politics in the church affected sometimes our loved ones. You know, Satan was the originator of this kind of spirit. He wanted to be like God. You know that already in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 13 to 14, there, were, there, are, there are five eyes. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. On the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. Five eyes. And as a result, what was the result? True enough, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15, but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Yes, Jesus' instruction was, but when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to your friend, move up to the a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. Then he laid out the principle in verse 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus himself was an example of humility. You know that in Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, your attitude should be the same as of Christ Jesus. Because first, you want, if be, who being in a very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, and second made himself nothing, Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And third, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And as a result, therefore in verse 9, God exalts him to the highest place and give him the name that is above every name. Wow. Descending your way to greatness. Thus, the best position in the the best the, the best position, brothers and sisters, is that is the place where the Lord assigns you. That is the best place, the best position in life. The place where the Lord assigns you. If we are in our Lord Jesus Christ our, and follow his example faithfully position is not the issue because we came to realize that the best position is to be with Christ and that's all that matters to be with Christ and to be like Christ is the best position in life that is the principle of uh, position. Be humble. The third, then Jesus said to his uh, then Jesus said to his host, "When uh, you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors." Wow. If you do, they may invite you back. And so you will be repaid. I don't know how many of us uh, did this. Okay. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. 
the, the third principle here is about popularity. I would like to make a clarification here on the passage. The passage does not mean that we cease anymore to invite our friends, our family members, relatives, or, or those who can pay us back. According to the Greek, the thought may be summed up, you know, the Greek uh, syntax. The thought may be summed up. Do not be in the habit of always inviting only your friends. Okay? Jesus does not exclude the entertainment of friends. In this pericope, Jesus laid out another principle of discipleship, and that is how to be popular, about popularity. Because many times, the motives of uh, inviting people to one special occasion, like marriage ceremony, at birthdays, and other special occasions, as, you, uh, as human beings, naturally, we want to be highly esteemed. esteemed. We want to establish a good uh, reputation. We want to be, in, uh, to be influential so that uh, human beings, so that uh, they can get more than what they have spent, right? Sometimes. Uh, human beings like that are like that. That's why when they, uh, you know, have a wedding, they would, uh, you would see in the wedding's uh, uh, program, the list of sponsors, you would see doctors, lawyers, engineers, public officials, you know, conference presidents, directors, and wealthy businessmen. Now, this principle teaches us that the popularity that counts it is not, the popularity the popularity that counts is not the popularity we can get in this world in Jesus teaching the popularity that counts is the popularity in God's eyes in God's kingdom because in the resurrection of the righteous, you will be repaid. God will, will acknowledge you. You will be known. He will know you because of what you have done. That is the popularity that counts. And the uh, fourth principle is... Uh, Found here in this very copy. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they, are, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And... The last, till another said, I just got married. So I cannot come. Moses could not understand this. Okay. So, the next uh, principle here is priority. Priority. What is our priority in life? In this pericope, those who were invited gave excuses. Let us examine their excuses. Number one, I have just bought a field 
and I go and see it. This is not an acceptable excuse, right? You even accepted at face value, the excuse was flimsy because the purchase had already been made. And without doubt, the purchaser had examined the ground carefully before closing the deal. So, not a good excuse. And everyone, I have bought five oaks, oh, yoke of oxen. Again, the purchase had already been made. And the purchaser was intent only on determining how good a bargain he had secured. And a task that easily might have been postponed if he had really a desire to attend the feast. Right? So that means this is again uh, not an acceptable excuse. The third excuse I think is a better one. I just got married. I just got married so I cannot come. You understand people who are just married. Uh, I hope Moses will uh, soon uh, have this experience. Uh, Moses? Yes, this is the most logical and acceptable excuse. But again, they can postpone their honeymoon just for one day, just to maintain a very important social relationship. Because in Oriental lands, to decline an invitation, I don't know in Africa, because you are near the, the, the Middle East, except where it is obviously impossible to accept, is often considered a refusal of friendship. Among some Arabs, to decline an invitation at the time of the reminder, in verse 17, after having accept, accepted the original invitation, is considered a declaration of hostility. And on the other hand, to accept an invitation and to attend a feast is supposed to indicate friendship. So that means they could postpone those appointments because this should be prioritized. So the point of Jesus is that we need to know our priorities. And in the parable, Jesus here refers to the, to the bount bounteous blessings of the kingdom of heaven under the symbol of a great feast. You know, this, uh, this, this parable was popular and Jesus' audience knew the symbol of this parable. This is a symbol of a, of a bounteous blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Thus, discipleship means prioritizing the kingdom of God over anything else. For sure, Jesus is not against doing business. For sure, Jesus is not against getting married because of course he, he is the author of marriage. He is not against any human activity that does not contradict his divine principles. What he is against with is when these things become hindrances in seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. Thus, instead of allowing our human business businesses to hinder our, to hinder us, make them as tools to advance the kingdom. That means doing business for the kingdom. Instead of allowing our human relationship to hinder us, let us make this effective as effective means in God's work. And uh, our priority in life should always be the kingdom, his kingdom and his righteousness. And the fifth, you know, I have only six. That means uh, I almost done. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, 
his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And I jump to 33 because the rest there are illustrations. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. The next principle there, the number five is price. What is the price of discipleship? And are we willing to pay the price? In this pericope, Jesus uh, stresses that the price of discipleship is your whole devotion to Him over your family ties, your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole obedience, your whole loyalty, even your whole life. You are willing to pay because this is the price of discipleship. There was a, a young lady. Uh, she was attending a, an evangelistic crusade. And then after the crusade, during the evening, Friday evening or Sabbath evening, in biblical reckoning, she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And then when she went home, she told her family, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I want to be baptized tomorrow. But her, her family, her parents and uh, siblings told her, you should not do it. Because if you will do it tomorrow, if you want to be baptized tomorrow, tomorrow also, we will consider you as dead. And you should not step in again in this house. So that was a great challenge. Whether she will pay the price or not. And Sabbath morning came. She was crying in the evening. She prayed to God. What would be her decision in life? And she decided. On the Sabbath morning she decided. She dressed up. She was crying. She told her parents, Nanay, Tai, Tatay in, in Bisaya. Tatay, Nanay, I want to follow Jesus. She dressed up. She went to church. And she was baptized that afternoon. But when she went back home, her parents were already there at the door waiting with her personal belongings. And told her, now you can go. Don't go back anymore. You are dead. You are considered dead in this family. Aside from that, she was kicked. She was slapped. She was punched. She was abused. And then she went. She lost her family. She was willing to pay the price. She lost her family. But praise God. She found another family. The family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And now she is a wife of a pastor. Amen. Praise God. Another, another believer. A lay evangelist. One day was giving Bible study to a certain family in Mindanao. My wife's place. And then... Uh, he was uh, about to, to get a decision the following Sabbath. Uh, she would get the decision of the family. And then, uh, yeah, uh, uh, by and by, there was someone who came in, in the sala, and told him, uh, Brother, I want to tell you that uh, that uh, I don't like you to come here anymore. I want to tell you that if you come here, 
The next time, you will bring back your head detached from your body. Bring back home your head. She went home. She was thinking. The whole uh, week, she was, he was thinking whether to pay the price of following Jesus. And finally, he decided to pay the price. He went there, back to that uh, home. He gave Bible study. He got the decisions to be baptized. And then the next Sabbath, they, will, they would be baptized. But uh, lo and behold, by and by, there was someone there at his back, uh, you know, uh, carrying, bringing a bolo, uh, a mach machete. And he was uh, struck. And uh, uh, struck. And uh, he was hit. And then he wa his, uh, uh, his head was almost detached, you know, from his body. He ran and fell down to the ground. And while dying, his uh, children came and he told, him, told them, you know, I don't want you to go to court. He died. And then, you know what? After several years, no, that Sabbath, the family were baptized. But surprisingly, several years later, the killer was also baptized. Because he was wondering why yeah, the family did not, the, the family of the of the of the layman did not go to court, did not sue him. He was uh, amazed what kind of people were this, and so he got interested and and, and again uh, received Bible study and was baptized, and and uh, he became uh, the president of of youth association in the district. Imagine that. Brother Felipe de Ramos was willing to pay the price of following Jesus. Yes. There were many Christians who paid the price for following Jesus. And because of their death, many also souls became Christians and were saved. The last principles, last principle in verses uh, 34 to 35. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit for neither for fit neither for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The last principle here is productivity. Yes, brothers and sisters, Jesus' expectation for us as his disciples is to produce that we may fulfill the purpose he intended us to do. Or to be a kind of Christian, or to have to, to to a Christian to a kind of a Christian life he wants us to be, in order to to exert an influence in the world for the salvation of the lost. He said that we are the salt of the earth, and but if the salt loses its saltiness is in, in Matthew 5.13. How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown. And that the, the emphasis here is that you are the salt of the earth in Matthew 5.13. That means, in other words, our, our existence as a church, as each day church, or as each day Christians, our existence here is not by accident or is not without purpose. It was, uh, it was not unplanned. It, it, was, it was planned. For sure, our existence as a church is in the divine plan. Revelation chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 14 tells us 
about this divine plan. We are here for a purpose. And God expects us to fulfill that purpose. He wants us to be what He wants us to be. And that is to be the salt of the earth. To be there in the society where people are crying for help with their hunger, with their diseases like Ebola, with their tragedies. To be there in the society where people are suffering because of terrorism by the Boko Haram. To be there in a society where people are hopeless. To be there in the society where people are victims of injustice and ills of our worldly government. To be there to show God's love. To be there to show God's peace. To be there to show God's solution to injustice. To be there to show the way, the truth, and the life. Yes, brothers and sisters, today, Jesus wants his wants disciples. Not only that Jesus wants disciples, he wants genuine disciples. Because fake disciples is counterproductive for the kingdom. So God, Jesus wants genuine disciples. He wants genuine disciples who are not only concerned with orthodoxy, but also with orthopraxy. He, want this, he wants disciples who are, who, are, who are concerned of their position with Christ. He wants disciples who want to be popular in the kingdom of God. He wants disciples who will prioritize the kingdom and his righteousness. He wants disciples who are willing to pay the price, whatever it is. He wants disciples who want to produce the character of Jesus to be the salt of the earth so that souls will find the way, the truth, and the life. Brothers and sisters, this is my prayer. That all of us will say, Lord, here I am. Count me in. May the Lord bless us. Amen.